Francisco, California, a momentous conference begins. Here, leaders of the United Nations, representing all but a fraction of the Earth's population, are laying the foundations of international security in the post-war world. United States Secretary of State Stettinius opens the first session and introduces President Truman, who speaks from Washington. The Conference of the United Nations on International Organization is now convened. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. The world has experienced a revival of an old faith in the everlasting moral force of justice. At no time in history has there been a more important conference or a more necessary meeting than this one in San Francisco. You members of this conference are to be the architects of a better world. In your hands rests our future. By your labors at this conference, we shall know if suffering humanity is to achieve a just and lasting peace. If we do not want to die together in war, we must learn to live together in peace. Just before the second day's session, the conference presents a pageant of nations banded together to make peace. Men of goodwill from around the world attend, including the distinguished Saudi Arabian delegation, and from South Africa, Prime Minister and Field Marshal Jan Christian Smuts, a founder of the League of Nations. General Romulo of the Philippines, China's famed foreign minister, T.B. Sung, and members of the Arabian entourage. Anthony Eden, Foreign Secretary of Great Britain. Soviet Foreign Commissar Molotov, British Ambassador to the United States Halifax, and Mr. Eden discuss conference details before the session in an atmosphere of cordial informality. They are joined by Secretary Stettinius and Russia's United States Ambassador Gromyko. These intimate pictures tell better than words the spirit of the San Francisco meeting at which world leaders can talk over their mutual problems freely and frankly. Already seated is India's delegate, Sir A. Ramaswamy Mudalia, Jan Masaryk, Foreign Secretary of Czechoslovakia and son of Czechoslovakia's late great founder, Thomas Masaryk. Ian van Kleffens heads the delegation of the Netherlands. John Sofianopoulos represents Greece. From Mexico comes Foreign Minister Ezekiel Padilla. Representing Lebanon is Charles Habib Malik. Mustafa Adil, Chairman of Iran's delegation. Egypt's representative, Abdul Hamid Badawi Pasha. The delegates discuss the many problems of the historic meeting. Facilities for the press reporting of the momentous news of San Francisco are the most elaborate on record. From here, thousands of dispatches go round the world. Special telephone switchboards are run by trained operators speaking two score languages. By radio and shortwave, the news goes out. Delegates of all nations lay emphasis on the urgency of their task, an undertaking which was outlined at Dumbarton Oaks and the Crimea Conference, says China's TV Sung. To ensure the fulfillment of our aims for effective international organization, we must lose no time. We must not leave this conference without having arranged for the setting up of a new international organization. Russia's Vyacheslav Molotov addresses the delegates. Mr. Molotov warns of the mistakes of the League of Nations and pledges firm Soviet cooperation for world security.
Britain's Anthony Eden speaks convincingly of the need for action now. In the last six terrible years, unnumbered men have died to give humanity another chance. A number, unnumbered men have died because they felt there was a job of work to be done. We too have a job of work to do if we are not to fail these men. Let us do it with courage, modesty, and dispatch. Let us do it now. In the streets of Milan lies the body of Benito Mussolini, first of the dictators and the first to go, executed by Italian partisans, his own countrymen. Mussolini, the would-be Caesar, the founder of fascism, started with an armed gang and finally built it into an army, seizing power after a sham march on Rome in 1922. Also now reported dead, Adolf Hitler came to study and emulate the master Mussolini, busy with plans for Ethiopia, Spain, and Mediterranean Empire. By 1938, Hitler was fascist number one, and Mussolini only a satellite at Munich. By 1943, Mussolini, defeated in Italy, was rescued by Nazi paratroops. Wild-eyed, he ran to Hitler. Now the last pictures of Il Duce alive in 1944. He died badly, despised by his fellow countrymen. This was the end of Benito Mussolini. Eisenhower, accompanied by Generals Bradley and Patton, their faces grim, inspects the concentration camp at Ordruf, Germany, captured by American troops. Everywhere are the emaciated dead. American troops force the people of the town to view the ghastly results of Nazi brutality. Start Germany, more victims of a brutality and methodical starvation too ghastly to put into words. Bodies are exhumed for autopsy and counting. Nordhausen, Germany, occupied by the First Army. The Red Cross flag now flies as United States medical troops bring what aid they can to the living dead. A few who still lived in Nordhausen lay helpless among the hundreds of completely dead when the troops entered. German civilians are marched into Nordhausen to dig graves for the dead. The German people who accepted the promises Nazism made must share responsibility for the deliberate brutality of the Nazi system. Ordruf, Arnstadt, Nordhausen, Buchenwald, Dachau, these and countless other crimes against humanity committed by Germany must not be forgotten as the world plans for peace.